Back in late September, an independence referendum was held in Iraqi Kurdistan. Over 93% of Kurds voted in favor of independence. Well, we've been waiting for a while and we finally received the response from the Iraqi government. And that was on October 16th, the Iraqi military assaulted Kirkuk, a place that just happens to have enormous oil wealth. Joining me to discuss this and get a lay of the land is Cameron Bokhari, a senior analyst with Geopolitical Futures. Cameron, thank you so much for joining me. I want to jump right into this. Give me the lay of the land. What does the situation look like in the region right now? Jonathan, the situation is essentially fluid, uh, but uh, if there's one thing that's certain, is it is that the Kurds have lost control of Kirkuk city, uh, the oil facilities around it, a military base, and they've been pushed back to the northern parts of the province, and they don't seem to be in a position to resist the Iraqi army, uh, backed by Iran and, of course, uh, encouraged by Turkey as well. So that is the latest situation where we are. Uh, it seems like there's going to be some form of negotiation, but it's not really clear at this point. Interesting. Okay, so I, I want to start out by talking about the American influence on this situation. I have read many people, have heard many people saying that this is a failure of Ameri American policy to at least foresee the fact that this was going to happen. Because obviously the Americans have been so con concentrated on ISIS they didn't realize that this was, A, the, the independence referendum was going to move ahead, and second of all, that the Iraqi government would have to have some sort of a response. Well, I mean, uh, that criticism, uh, you know, is, is valid only if you assume that the United States operates beyond any constraints. So, uh, you know, yes, the United States is, is the world's superpower and has a, a tremendous amount of influence uh, that it can bring to bear. But at the end of the day, there are constraints that even Washington operates under. And that is that uh, while fighting ISIS, you need the Kurds to fight ISIS. You need the Shia-dominated central government to fight ISIS. But you can't fully control what they want. And in this case, the Kurds calculated that this is probably the right time to push for secession from Iraq. And so there is no way that the United States could have blocked it. Did the United States know about it? Of course, everybody knew about it. Uh, but the question is what to do when you have a bigger problem, uh, which is ISIS, and, and that war is still unfolding, even though Mosul has been liberated. But ISIS is still out there. And even though, you know, next door in Syria, Raqqa has been liberated as well by the Syrian Kurds. But that doesn't mean that the United States controls all these uh, partners in that region. Interesting. Okay. So uh, it's also out there that Iranian, a Shia-backed Iranian mil uh, militias have been operating in this part of the world and, and involved in what's happened here. To what degree is Iran playing with this situation? And to what degree are the Americans aware of this and you know, to a certain extent either supporting or just turning a blind eye to what's happening? So there is this understanding that I Iraq is, is becoming a vassal state of Iran. Uh, I would argue that a lot of that has already happened. Uh, and, and it really, uh, this situation solidified itself when the United States had to withdraw forces from the country in 2011 because a new status of forces agreement was not reached with the Iraqi government. And so uh, that's already the case. So therefore, it is only natural that Iran has a disproportionate amount of influence over uh, the Shia of Iraq. And now, mind you, it's not just the Shia militias. It is also the Shiite-dominated central government. It is also, to a certain degree, certain Sunni actors that uh, are willing and prepared to do work with either Iran directly or through its allies in Baghdad. And then on top of that, even amongst the Kurds, the Iranians have influence that dates back decades. And so, for example, the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, one of the factions that controls uh, the western half of Kurdistan uh, is some is an ally of the Iranians, and the Iranians can play games and uh, divide and conquer uh, between the Kurds, and that's what has happened, which is why the Kurds were not able to resist the Iraqi army. Interesting. Okay. Well, the, a final question that's going down this track, and then we're, we're going to do something else. But President Donald Trump just last week uh, did a major policy speech, and in that speech, he basically lambasted. Iran, and particularly went after the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. And here, a week later, or just a few days later, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard is to some extent involved in what's happening in Kirkuk against what's perceived as an American ally. 
What is that message? What, what message is being sent back to the U.S. by Iran in this situation? I'm not sure if this particular issue is a direct message from Iran to the United States in response to the Trump administration's efforts to alter the nuclear deal and to crack down further on the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, the elite military force of Iran. I think that this was in Iran's interest not to allow uh, the Kurds of Iraq to, you know, sp uh, so to speak, jump out of the box that they're in and declare independence or move towards independence, take advantage of the fact that Iraq is fractured, because that's not in the interest of Iran, uh, because there's there are Kurds in Iran who would do the same again. So I think this was something that was primarily done, what uh, the, the Iranian backing for the Iraqi government to uh, take Kirkuk from the Kurds, I think that was more in Iranian interest. Now, the United States uh, still continues to push on the nuclear issue, but it's not so much about the nuclear issue. It is about the Iranians using the sanctions respite to enhance their regional influence. And that's something that's not in the American interest. And therefore, it is only natural that the Trump administration will use the nuclear agreement to try and counter Iranian advances in the region. So, look, obviously in these independence referendum, 93% of Kurds voted in favor of their own state. And it, it seems clear that they're not going to stop anytime soon, you know, wanting, you know, fulfilling that desire. So where do we go from here, given what the situation looks like? I think the behavior of the Iraqi Kurds since the loss of Kirkuk speaks for itself. Uh, they are reportedly ready to negotiate with Baghdad to the extent that those reports are accurate. At the very least, they are not mounting a counteroffensive. They are bitterly divided amongst themselves. Uh, and then strategically, they're landlocked. Uh, the two major powers on their borders, Iran and Turkey, do not want them to have independence. Uh, they are no match for the Iraqi forces. So they're in a bind. I mean, they're not really moving towards independence uh, anytime soon. You know, the, the, the Iraqi forces have to completely collapse, which is unlikely. And the Iranians and the Turks have to at least look the other way, which is also not happening. So I don't see how the Kurds are moving towards independence. They can have, you know, the, uh, their desire certainly will not go away. But that doesn't mean that they can translate their, uh, you know, vision into reality. So at this point, do the Kurds have any friends? I think that at this point, the Kurds are without friends. I mean, the United States is an ally of the Kurds. But at the same time, it's not in the American interest. And this is why U.S. forces essentially look the other way when Iraqi troops and, and, and uh, other forces uh, essentially assaulted uh, the Peshmerga. Interesting. Well, Kamran, we'll be watching to see what happens next year. There are a lot of developments just since the last time you and I talked. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Jonathan.